Hey, great webinar afternoon again. This is Maya with, with Frosma. Oh, we're co-hosting a customer experience webinar together with our partners Amaze Realize and Contentful. And it's really nice quality, excellent uh, discussions and presentations experiences coming ahead. And uh, this is us who's going to be talking today. We have Chris Barnes, uh, Director for Customer Experience at Amaze Realize. He has a very nice framework and great case examples on how your CX is broken and what you, you should do about it. And we have Christine Montag-Brown from Contentful. She's head of partnerships and we're working with her very closely and she's going to talk about um, content infrastructure for agile e-commerce. And my name is Maya Erkeki. I work with partners here at Frasma and I'll talk about the, the power of personalization. And uh, this is the agenda for today. The way we've divided this is, uh, first Chris will talk about why UCX is broken, and then um, we'll talk about the uh, personalized customer journeys, then we'll talk about the content infrastructure. And we're kind of taking turns speaking here. You can uh, submit your questions with the questions and answers panel at GoToWebinar. We're really happy to, to able to, to get the questions, I'll be um, able to review them here and I'll be asking the questions from other presenters. So questions are welcome at any time. But since time is limited, we'll move forward with this kind of a heavy statement that your CX is broken. So Chris, welcome to the webinar and let us hear your thoughts. Well, hello everyone and thank you for making the time to join us. I'm going to give you a brief overview of how Amaze Realize helps companies map and identify pain points in their overarching customer experiences. But first, I thought I'd start with an example of kind of a bad CX experience that I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with. Now, this happens to me every 12 to 18 months when the TV and broadband deal that you sign up for kind of ends, and then they send you a piece of paper telling you they're putting the price up. So you get annoyed by this and you ring them up and you ask for a new package only to be told the price that you see on the website is just for new customers. So this immediately puts you back up and it gives you the impression that they don't really care about you and it makes you feeling a little bit unhappy. So then it's not until you threaten to cancel and they put you through to the special cancellations team who, if targets are not being hit, they magically offer you the, the similar deal of new customers. And so if that happens, all great and you stay. But if those targets have already been met and they haven't got any special deals to give you, you're told there's nothing we can do. So what you do, you jump ship and you go to the other company and start the whole process all over again. I suppose that's a great example of a mo key moment of truth that makes or break your relationship with a brand. They could have the best TV and broadband in the world, but if they make you feel like they don't value you, you're just going to jump ship and move your feet and go elsewhere. They essentially lose the relationship at a key pivotal moment when they could have kept you as a loyal branded customer. But in reality, these companies are not really set up for success, and it's not the folks on the phone that you're talking to whose fault it is that they can't do anything. They're just doing their jobs as instructed. They are, they're targeted on new acquisitions, and their marketing and product offering is skewed towards acquiring new customers. It's not meant to keep new ones. They're not measured on the lifetime value of a customer. They're measured on short-term KPIs about growth. So they prioritize making sign-up as easy as possible. They allow you to add features that allow you to add on extras in self-service kind of login areas, but they deprioritize kind of the building of any features that make you downgrade in the package possible. And they make leaving an even longer drawn out process. So they're essentially creating their own pain points based on what they've targeted their employees to do. You should be able to skip on the slides. <laughs> yeah. So we need to remember that kind of great customer experiences about improving that entire customer journey, not just the beginning of that relationship. So if we just focus on the start of the relationship, they're not going to last long term, as, as kind of my point was proven above. And improving your CX isn't just about getting more customers either or improving conversion. It's, it seems to be a hot topic at the moment and there are lots and lots of people kind of writing articles out there with, with thought pieces saying how you can improve your CX when what they're really saying is how to create a better checkout form. So we need to be looking more holistically across the entire customer journey. We need to be figuring out the key pivotal moments where we can make a positive impact for both existing and new customers and the business. 
But we need to remember that CX is more than just about making customers happy. It's about adopting a customer first mentality. But businesses who do this are seeing a 10% increase in revenue. They're seeing a 25% decrease in costs. They're seeing customers willing to pay more for their products and services because they're happy. And they're seeing 64% of customers more likely to recommend them to, to their friends and family, which is great for everyone. Skip on. Mm -hmm. Skip on two if you want. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I got it. So, what do we have to do to identify where those key moments are and how we can make a difference? Uh, I may mean, realize we often start by kind of creating a high level benchmark of where customers are currently experiencing positive and negative experiences in the entire customer journey. We then measure each of those steps in the journey and review a, a, each step about against the potential to make a bigger, wider, overarching impact to that experience. The journeys can be done as an overall summary, as an individual's customer experience, or for individual persona types. So, for instance, a single parent of two who's having a, who's traveling on a train on the next slide will have a very different need and expectation of a business traveler who's going in first class. The difference to their customer experience will be determined by different interactions and different touch points based on, on that brand's interaction and their customer needs. So thinking about that and going back to my example with the TV and broadband example, uh, if you skip on to the next slide, we'll see like if we was to map out their customer experience, we'll see a massive negative spike at the end of their renewal stage for their journey. And if we compare just to the purchasing section, it'd be all kind of positive. But it'd help identify where they should spend their budget and where they should push their priorities to overarch, to over, overly improve that customer experience. For instance, they could then decide to kind of Instead of me playing games of switching at the end of the year, they could give me control and treat me the same as a new customer. They could allow me to have the same deals as new customers. But they could go a step further, and instead of offering me like, like a predetermined one-size-fits-all package, they could use the data about me that I've been using on, my, on watching to give me a personalized package based on my usage habits. They could automatically tweak that deal if my usage habits changed and send me an update automatically telling me they're reducing my bill. That then will take a great pain point and turn it into a positive moment, and that positive experience is something that will keep me loyal and make me an advocate. So how, the first step for us is about identifying how to really turn those pain points into an advantage. But as well as understanding where those pain points are and where we need to improve, we also need to know where, like, how to measure success and what success will change if we do it. Because again, a great CX isn't just about improving revenue, it, and it isn't also just about a great NPS score. It's about things like greater re customer retention, lower complaints, less calls to call centers, better reviews. And so people don't get angry on the, on, on the calls to the cancellations team. It means decreased costs. So as well as looking at that overarching emotional journey, we should look at how we're measuring the success and what business value it will give, your, give people across that business. And it could be a mixture of NPS scores, customer satisfaction scores, but it could also be positive brand sentiment and uh, um, kind of lower complaints, as well as the traditional kind of increase in revenues and increase in conversion scores. I'll skip on a few. <laughs> Again, this is just a journey showing kind of the opposite measurement scale. So where we've identified the key moments in red, how do we use the measurements to then specific customer experience measurement scores to ensure that we're doing a great job. But once we've included kind of what moments went to earn and where we need to measure, we have to go a little bit detail and kind of kind of dive into the journey in a little bit more detail. So we create an experience map on the next slide. That map helps to articulate all the different touch points across a customer's entire journey, across both online and offline channels. And some of these moments might just be simple, just do it feature implementations. Some of it might be moments of, of complexity that require personalization and engines behind them to work. And some may require more fundamental business changes to implement, such as the changing of, of products and business rules and how we manage people. But the main advantage of a map like this is it allows us to see all the business priorities across every single customer channel and, and create connections in that customer journey appropriately and prioritize one end of the journey to the other. It also, from a personalization point of view, allows us to start creating experiences that are cross-channeled. So, for example, a welcoming message on a phone call, cent a phone call center agent will give might vary depending on what I've just done on a website. 
and going back to Sky, if I rang them after looking at the cancellation page, I should be treated differently to if I've just ordered a movie. Because my complaint will be different and we can use intelligence to defer what I might be using. But once we've understood what we need to do and how we need to do it, and we're on the road to implement implementing that great customer experience, we need to keep up with people's expectations and the changing behaviors. We need to understand kind of that people's feedback is essential to continuously keeping them up to date with kind of people's expectations. So as technology changes the way we interact with the world, and new products and services kind of change expectations. So as Uber comes out, it changes the transportation game. It becomes the new normal, and we need to again, again, measure ourselves against that. So one of the great ways to do that is to gain insight through kind of context-aware messaging. And instead of just putting a blank message in front of someone's face as soon as they arrive on the page, we can use kind of new personalized messaging that places kind of contextually aware feedback loops within the customer's journey. So whether or not they've just started the journey or finished it, we can change the message to get the right feedback in the right time. So we've been using tools like usability as well to do this, to put voice of the customer experience straight back into the feedback loop. If we flick on mm -hmm, the slides. Mm -hmm. But again, we have to remember that a great customer experience isn't something that you just put in place and then leave alone. They're constantly evolving to keep up with those ever-changing expectations of the world. And because they're always changing, we need more than just ad hoc feedback, and we need to make sure that we're concentrating on the right moments. Because an idea that we identified six months ago might have been made redundant by a new piece of technology, or a competitor might have come in the marketplace and completely negated the need to, to tackle something. So we need to constantly prioritize where we're putting our efforts to ensure we're adapting as quickly as possible to the needs of our customers. So just collecting this ad hoc feedback won't tell us everything. We need to overlay this with regular customer interviews, with focus groups, with analytics data, with call center strand trips, with personalization and A-B testing results so that we can ensure that we're making the right progress. So I may have realized we use a framework that puts all this data and insights at the center of an ongoing optimization program. And this optimization program ensures that we're making the changes that we're making are not made in vain. And it means we're using the insights to define constantly the actions that we need to prioritize on a weekly, monthly, and three monthly basis. But personalization does play a big part in that optimization framework. And the recommended recommendations we make have more personalization coming into them. And the more we personalize that experience, the better the engagement that we see with customers. And overall, the better customer experience we see for them. Because we move from a one-to-many experience to a one-to-one -one experience. And we can provide different features to different customer segments and ultimately improve their experience. So that was kind of a whistle-stop tour of some of the things that we're amazed to realize we think about as we kind of look at the overarching customer experience. And I'll be a good time for handover to Maya from Frosma, who will dive a little deeper into where we can use that personalization online. Hey, thank you, Chris. That was really, really insightful. Uh, we have one question. You can answer this now or at the end. What do you think if you would have to give like one piece of advice or the other way around, what is the biggest mistake you see that uh, companies are making at the moment with their, with their CX? I think not necessarily looking holistically across that view. I think going back to that point, CX has become a bit of a buzzword at the moment and it's still too focused on acquisition. We're not necessarily looking at kind of the wider lifetime value of a customer and we're still putting far too much effort on just acquiring new customers. I think mm -hmm. if we look broader across it and we can spend more environment and get people talking across departments, they'll get much better results than working in silos, especially just at one part of the um, customer journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Hey, that's a that's a great segue to personalization because it's it's part of my my um, thoughts as well. So, do you want to say um, anything else on the cycle for constant optimization, or next we'll move on? We'll move on. Yeah. So, power of personalization. Uh, Chris talked about this a little bit. Like, what is personalization? And uh, definitely, I'm fully on board with the fact that it's more than just optimizing for the next click. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, the first, the reason, of course, why? Why should I do this? Why should I take another task? Uh, of course, the situation is such that people are different. Their journeys are different. Uh, they are in a different situation. 
uh, we have these examples here. If you have somebody who's on the site for the first time, maybe coming through a campaign or someone else who has abandoned a cart twice. You get a very, very small amount of real estate with them, especially if it's on the phone. It's like an attention span of a couple of seconds. You have the small screen. So you have to use the time and the space as efficiently as possible and giving an, an experience that's, that's relevant. And, uh, and it's not only that I, I, I want them more, but it's kind of like that and an analog to waiting online. Like nobody wants to wait online in the store the same thing with personalization is that people want to find what they are looking for and they want, want to find it easily. So personalization is the, is the way on catching them on the right moment. And as Chris was saying, along the journey, there are moments where you also need, need to help from a personalization engine. And this is, just to put it shortly, this is the process. So if you look at the process on the, on the bottom of the slide, you can take any data on the visitor of the context or the context, so it, where are they coming from? Are they interested in a campaign? Um, is it a sunny day today or is it raining? What is happening? So on the, uh, around this person you see on purpose, we have sort of a visitor who's unknown. We don't know who it is, but we know a lot of things. So we might know this contextual information. We might know some behavioral patterns, some interest areas. We know some, might know some demographical data. Oh, and we might have an idea with the current needs and intents, especially now with the help of algorithms and machine learning, we might be able to predict what they are looking for. So with all this information, uh, we will create an individual experience for each person each time. And then we'll be tracking the KPIs that you always need to select based on your business. So exactly as Chris was saying, that if you only optimize for the new customer acquisition, that's then what you get. And we now have um, sort of met with a lot of customers who say that, who's, or they say that, hey, we've been like optimizing for conversion and the funnel all the time, and now we've kind of lost the brand on the way. And they want to bring the brand back to the site and really make that uh, visible and, and part of the experience again. And, and related to the KPIs, the way we see this is that you really get this positive cycle. And uh, there is a lot of research at the moment on like what is personalization giving you. And even though like one of the points with online is, is the shopping for the cheapest, uh, lowest price, uh, there is actually some research, for example, by Salesforce saying that um, six, uh, 67% of customers are willing to pay more for great experience. So it's not always race to the bottom. There's, there is also room for your brand and for your experience. And what's in the middle research by Boston Consulting Group that companies in, with personalization see the revenue increase from 6 to 10%. That is something that's quite realistic that we see among our customers. And what is contributing to that, it's, I earlier mentioned that there is this sort of a positive cycle. We'll talk, about, we'll talk about the compound business value of personalization. So if you start here on the left-hand side and you think that when, you, when your site is personalized and you use the little piece of real estate you have as well as possible, the visitor on the site, uh, they feel that it's, it's convenient, it's easy, it's, it's exactly what I'm looking for, and it's kind of matching with that, with that moment in my journey. You start seeing these positive effects, of course, on the conversions, which is a traditional measure. Uh, average order values is another one in, in retail. Also something that our customers see are reduction in bounce rate. And that's quite important when you think of the overall efficiency, efficiency of your digital marketing effort because bounce rate is, is influencing your ratings greatly. And then with those, you see revenue improvements, but then you also start seeing if, if the experience is good and um, product or service is good, of course, you start seeing loyalty and you see more repeat customers, better brand recognition, which typically gives you the last sort of piece of this positive, positive cycle is the lower uh, unit cost of customer acquisition. So let's say if your digital marketing budget is fixed and you can make get more customers with your budget, uh, you can actually then spin this cycle even faster. So that's really what we are looking to influence. And of course, 
if the experience on your site is broken, as Chris was referring to, then this uh, cycle is going to run run uh, counterclockwise, which is not good, not good for your business. Um, how we then start thinking on what to do? I think you'll get great tools from this webinar. Chris was um, showing some of the um, tools they are using. Uh, this is an example of this business value use case canvas in retail. So when we start discussing with the customer that, okay, what should I do? So we often start thinking of their business objectives, the top three here, conversion, value, loyalty, and then drilling down to the user segmentation. And this is now the powerful one where you can segment based on the moment, on their journey, you can segment based on their interest, but you can also segment based on the situation. So if, if for example, they have product in the cart lower than the free shipping threshold, you, would, you might want to give them some special promotion. But you might want to change the entire experience. So if we see that somebody is coming to the site with the mobile phone, uh, we might want to give them a different experience entirely than with the desktop. And then uh, we help going down, we go down to personalized experience that, okay, based on these KPIs, this segmentation, these are the type of experiences uh, we will create for your site. And then the KPIs, the, the business value you, you'll be able to create. Here are some examples of typical KPIs. We do conversions, bounds, order values, and of course, returning customers, uh, organic traffic. So when you build that, like build sort of the logic that from this business objective, through this segmentation, this experience, these are the things we measure. That's how you start spinning the positive cycle. And the last thing I want to give you is this checklist. And okay, how do I, how do I go about personalization? And uh, this is probably something that also Chris's team is, is, is working on or helping customers to do is so starting, always start with the hypothesis. At my hypothesis is that, for example, this campaign will generate more revenue if, um, if we have a personalized landing page. And then you go with the four W's. We talk about who, when, where, and what. And define all these target audiences, uh, what is the context, what is the place on the site, and what do we want to show? Is it some content? Is it uh, action? Is it recommendation? And uh, based on all these, these four W's, you can create a personalized experience and then see your results. And if you see, we have two feedback loops here on the slide. So we have on the, the top one is our like A-B testing results and conversion data. And you can sort of manually analyze and, and modify your hypothesis and, and run your next experiment differently. But then there is the power of the algorithm. So machine learning and algorithm-based optimization, where you actually allow the algorithm to decide that what is the experience that is shown to this target. Uh, and, and what we see and what our customers have seen is that the algorithm plus human intelligence is, is still the best, sort of the winning formula. And they basically, our customers, they use algorithms, but they also modify them with the insights and information they have. And that would be my recommendation, recommendation as well. So that's kind of the checklist on the power of personalization. Uh, we have there here like one part of the what is, is the content. And I think that's a great segue to content infrastructure. So I will now hand this over to Christine from Contentful, who is going to give you some insights and the way how to think about your content infrastructure in this new world where the entire customer journey is, is digital and you have to be able to build digital products on a, on a fast pace. So all yours, Kristen. Thank you very much, Maya, and thanks for your your yeah the insightful um, slides uh, and, and yeah you showed us. Um, so like you said, if you go to the next slides, um, we will also see that um, Gartner did a survey where they wanted to find out what the challenges were for digital commerce teams, and the majority they said that delivering uh, the desired customer experience is their biggest challenge. And it's always, you can always see rank one, two, and three. So it's really uh, what's most important to them. But basically, all of these 
items their importance. If we go a little bit uh, further down the line, we also see um, consistently serving customers across all sales channels. Unified message. Um, like also, Chris said, we need to see things holistically and uh, take a look at the whole customer journey. And another one that um, I found interesting was um, adding new features as often as we would like. So they would like to add new features to the website, to mobile apps. Um, and we also see that customers would like to add new touch points. So yeah, like Maya said, how do we do this? How do we communicate with our clients? We need content and we need the right content infrastructure in place. So if you go to the next slide and let it build up, you can actually see that uh, content is not just you know isolated text and images but it's it's a strategic investment you find content on all kinds of uh, or yeah in all kinds of channels um, in different uh, teams business units at the organization and uh, this image you also shows that uh, you need to be able to reuse content in your multiple touch points that you have. So something like FAQs you have on a website, you might want to reuse them in a customer portal. Or, you know, a product description um, that you have on the website, you might want to reuse them in a mobile app. So you need the right content infrastructure in place to make this possible and to, yeah, to basically guarantee this, this um, you know, omni-channel and person personalized journey that we were just uh, talking about. So if you go to the next slide, um, our vision is that uh, rather looking at traditional content management systems, or we can also call them digital experience suites, like the ones you see here, um, we would rather say be more flexible and build your own digital experience stack. Because the traditional experience suites, they can quickly give you a limit. So if you want to add new features to your website, you might be very slow doing that because you need to customize it a lot. And APIs might not be available. Or it might be difficult to get content or reuse content that you have on a website and use it for a, for a digital screen. And uh, yeah, so these, these traditional um, approaches slow you down. And this is why uh, we say, um, Use, yeah, use content infrastructure combined with the best of breed solutions that you need to achieve your goals. So as an example, you would use Frosmo for personalization. You could use an e-commerce solution like Commerce Tools or Malton or Elastic Path, you know, there are Shopify, you know, there are many on the market um, to, to create your e-commerce experience. And then you can combine these solutions together and, and you know, create one seamless flow. And you can see more and more examples here, you know, as your digital asset management, you can use Binder or Cloudinary, you can integrate Search, for example, with Algolia or Elasticsearch, you know, there are all kinds of solutions. And with this method, you can really create your preferred uh, digital tech stack or your preferred architecture for your project. And, and um, yeah, and, and this will also help you to achieve your goals. And another thing is also that Contentful um, is decoupled from the front end. So it's decoupled from your digital a touch point, which allows you more flexibility. And um, yeah, this way you can, for example, relaunch your, your site faster or you can add new features, um, you know, in, in matters of, of days instead of weeks or months. So uh, yeah, talking about you know the the digital experience stack and talking about um, extending your your content infrastructure, we can look at the next slide and see how the contentful web app that the editors would use can be extended with uh, what we call UI extensions or you could also say widgets um, to be able to get access to other. Um, other tools and other solutions. So uh, in terms of Frosmo, we could, for example, have a UI extension that shows you the, the user profiles within Contentful. And then when the editor creates, you know, an article or a blog post or a product description, or, you know, just a, like a landing page that they want to test or like a certain entry that should only be visible for a certain user group, then from within the Contentful web app, they can select the profile that this entry should be shown for. And then we were talking about e-commerce, and this is about content infrastructure and agile e-commerce scenarios. So um, when you uh, connect Contentful with an e-commerce tool, then, for example, you could have all your products um, sit in the e-commerce tool. And then again, if you write a product description, 
the content for the product description would sit in Contentful, but the like the product name and the SKU number um, and the price they could come from from the e-commerce tool. And with the UI extensions, the editor would never need to leave the Contentful web app, and you can build again exactly the experience that you need for your for your projects. And here we see some examples with Spotify, Marketo, and Google Analytics. Okay, then we can look at uh, the next slide and see how this would uh, work together with uh, Frosmo and then also with um, um, our partners like um, Amaze Realize who would build the front end. And uh, here you can see three user groups. You see the content creator or editor, the e-commerce manager who's responsible for optimization and the front end developer. And they all do what they can do best. So the content creator would um, you know, create and manage and publish content and content for. The e-commerce manager could work either with Frosmo or with Frosmo within Contentful. So both would work. And, uh, and then the, the front end developer would help you create your front end with uh, frameworks like React uh, or Angular and um, yeah, create exactly the customer experience that you need on, on all uh, required channels. Excellent. I'll, I'll make one addition because what I like seeing are the words e-commerce and content on the same slide. Since that's one question we get a lot is that how do I start like uh, sort of matching, matching my products and my content on my e-commerce site? So more and more when um, when our customers want to offer targeted content, they want to kind of ma match them with the relevant articles or other relevant content, or then on, in media, it's the other way around. So there's a lot of content, but we want to recommend maybe some promotional products in, be in between. So like mixing, mixing and matching your products, your content on your commerce site is, is definitely a big trend we are seeing at the moment. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, and if we go to the next slide, we yeah. can uh, also see um, how further you can enhance the um, the experience for your internal user groups, so for your editors and developers. So um, just as a few examples, so there are some uh, you know features that come within Contentful as the content platform, and then uh, so as Contentful, we only do one thing: we store, manage, and deliver content. And if you do, uh, if you need anything else, then then you would look at integrations. And I already mentioned a few, and you can see it's split up by edit by um, user groups here. So the editors, they get their digital asset management, they can do experimentation, they get the e-commerce access, and the developers, they get SDKs, webhooks, uh, migration, CLIs, um, you know, access to Gatsby, Netlify, and so on and so on. So they can really build what they need to build. So yeah, and so I would like to uh, give you an example, if you look at the next slide, with uh, TUI Nordics, um, one of our clients who are also using Frosmo. And they could uh, accelerate the developer and editor productivity with, um, you know, having content infrastructure in place. So they could reuse this same architecture. It's, and again, Contentful is just a piece of a puzzle. They also use other solutions and several teams could use that. And this way they could create uh, new touch points very quickly and are five times faster with the launch of new touch points. And the editors, they could reuse content across channels. And if I remember correctly, they have... 14 UI extensions that they built to, to really um, optimize the editor experience. And in terms of uh, results for their, for their customers, we could see that the, the load times of the, the website decreased by 78% just because the front end was decoupled from the back end and optimized. Um, then also as it was so much faster, the bounce rate was reduced by 31%. And they're using a uh, personalization and we could see that the conversion rate on mobile increased by 11%. So these are true business results that um, show you how impactful um, a, a digital experience stack can be. And then on the next slide, I would like to just mention one example, which is um, <coughs> Talent. Uh, they are they're also using Contentful for many, many different, like for 10 different business units and they have like hundreds of projects on Contentful. And they recently, um, integrated uh, Contentful with a personalization solution and uh, could already see a 14% increase. 
So, so it's really amazing what you can do. And it's all, yeah, all depends on, you know, your, your the great front end. How is your CX built? How have you thought it through? Is it holistic? And, uh, you know, how do you uh, use your personalization solution? And do you have an architecture that is reusable? And uh, with this, I'm coming to the next, uh, to the last slide, which basically uh, summarizes what you get when, when you use a digital experience stack. And uh, yeah, we can see that you're much, much more flexible because you use the best solutions uh, you want and you can uh, create the custom experience that your clients desire. Um, you also can increase your time to market uh, a lot and uh, yeah, much faster with new features and digital touch points and can beat the competition. And you can increase your revenue. We've seen it now uh, several times um, by using personalization and uh, increasing your conversion rate. And that's it from my side. Hey, great. Thank you. Uh, now we are kind of done with the, with the time, but uh, I, I'll still ask you, like Christine, we're summarizing your, your key takeaways. But um, let's say if you, Chris, want people to remember one thing from the webinar, what is the one thing you, they should remember? What's the question? I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I need to mute myself. Now, uh, uh, Chris, Chris had his uh, presentation first. Oh, the, the one thing I'd say to take away would be that to create a great customer experience, you have to, as I said earlier on, just look holistically right across the beginning to the end. And it's about prioritizing the best moment or the quickest moments that you can also make the biggest impact with. You don't have to redevelop everything. You can make quick little changes to have a massive impact. Hey, that's great. So uh, definitely, then I will I will add on to that that it's a it's a continuous cycle. So when you start, as as Chris was saying, with the little effort that gives you a big impact, then you have to keep on running the continuous cycle of optimization, and that helps you to to then have the cycle of cycle of compound business value. So you, Christine, you already had a summary slide, uh, but if if you want to pick out one thing, what is the one thing you would want everyone to go home with? Yeah, I would say um, be brave, look at uh, new ways of doing things, look at a modern architecture because this also allows you to be ready for the future and ready for any new, um, you know, touch points uh, that might come. And uh, yeah, um, you know, make sure you have a great customer experience so that uh, your customers remain loyal and, uh, and you can increase your revenue. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thanks both to you, Christine and Chris, and uh, thanks to everyone in the audience. Uh, we'll, we'll send out the, the recording and the materials, and then we'll go from here. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Yeah.